Hi, I'm Deborah Johnson, and today what we're going to do is um, continue in our being an established saint. Number two, we need to just stop reframing the truth. Heavenly Father, thank you that your son died, was buried, and rose again. It's simple faith in his blood and what he accomplished on that cross that gets us saved eternally so that we can go to you in, in heaven when we die to live there with you forever. We get the Holy Spirit and we become a new creature. We're just grateful for that. Help us as we um, listen to this message that it eternally impacts us uh, in our thinking. If there's any areas that are off, help us to allow, to yield and let the Spirit lead us to be all we are in Christ. In your precious Son's name, amen. Okay, what we're going to do today, let's turn to um, Acts 2. Uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about church tradition. Uh, I can talk to you uh, from my experience. I was, I was raised, grew up in a Lutheran church, but many denominations, most, are the same. And that is that there's a focus on the concrete, um, which is um, Jesus and his life, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's what the focus was when I grew up. They would take a verse and then they would expound on it or tell a story about it. That was the extent. That in um, readings that we would do, responsive readings. Um, the pastor would say one thing, we would say the other. It was the same thing every single week. I didn't take a lot of thinking on our part, and there was no encouragement to go back and study things for yourself. Um, the pastor was seen as the one that knew. He was exalted, and we just did our weekly thing coming to church. Um, maybe that sounds unkind, but as I look back, that's the way I view it now. Um, uh, fundamentally, they just really didn't believe that um, that the body of Christ and Israel were two separate things. As a matter of fact, um, what I see now is they really believed that um, somehow Israel fell out of favor. If you, if you read the Old Testament, you could see why they thought that, and that now they the church today are spiritual Israel, um, basically taking over for Israel because they failed and God um, threw them out, basically. And it's an erroneous belief uh, that we're the new spiritual Israel. Let me just give you an example of how this is seen. Chapter 2 of Acts, Pentecost. In uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Let's read, it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. This is a group of believers, um, the disciples and those that were closest to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a listing there in chapter 1, verse 13. Um, they're in an upper room waiting for the promise of the Spirit. Um, verse three, and there appeared two, three, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled, all, all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Um, and so the focus here, even here in verse 5 is the Jews. They were in Jerusalem. They were waiting for the promise that they were, they were all Jews. They were uh, of one mind. This is the little flock. And let's just skip over to 14. So Peter, as the head of the 12, um, he stands up. And he starts preaching. But look at the audience. It says, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, 
ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in, at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. There were many that did not actually dwell in Jerusalem, but they came into Jerusalem, um, uh, Jew, Jewish believers. Remember at this time, the Gentiles were dogs. They were, they had no fellowship, no, no connection with the Gentiles. Look, um, let me just see. Let me follow my notes here. Verse 22. Let's just, you read the context for yourself. We don't have time to do that. It says 22, ye men of Jerusalem, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth. And he goes on and, and teaches. He goes on and I might be skipping some, but I'm just going to give you a few. Uh, verse 29, men and brethren, relating to in the context, the men at the, the Jewish men at Jerusalem and 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Um, the context is exceedingly clear, and yet most denominational viewpoints are the church started here in Acts 2. Why? Because they've reframed it to believe that they are spiritual Israel. Israel, some are uh, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people are somehow out of the picture, and now it's the body, church, the body of Christ. Um, that's commonly understood. It's reframing the truth, though, because we know that, and we're not going to go there to all these things, but in Acts 9, Paul is raised up and given a commission to go to the Gentiles. And Acts 28, 28 is the final uh, setting aside temporarily Israel and God, God commissions Paul to go to the Gentiles and they will hear it. And then that, then the next book on the agenda that God put in the, the Bible, Romans, Romans through Philemon. Romans is the establishing book. It establishes us in our faith and helps us to understand the basics of the gospel and to grow up from a babe to an adult son and daughter, uh, spiritually speaking. So um, we can't go through everything. I'm just going to give, um, this is just a little overview about the reframing. And so um, they don't understand how to rightly divide and Pauline truth as they stay in this position where the church starts here instead of, let's say, in Acts 9 when, when God raises up Paul and there's a new message and God starts revealing new things to the Apostle Paul. It took time. He didn't get it all at once. He had several revelations. So um, how is it that that the church reframes and us too? We, if we don't really see what we're doing, we do it without even knowing we're doing it because that's what we're taught in the church, modern Christianity today. In general, this is what's taught. Um, that, um, and, and it affects everything. Um, if you want to know more about rightly dividing, go to my lesson number seven in lighting the fire. It's about the word. Um, and how it's activated in us. That's what lighting the fire is. And it, I, I go over the rightly dividing and some of the other issues. The whole series might be helpful. <clears throat> I'm not going to do that today. So um, how has the church reframed things? Well, number one, to make Israel's program work for us, we have to reframe it. We have to, because in the context, it just is so clear. It's talking about Israel. So when they see Israel and men of Judea, they think that's us. It's not really to Israel. It's to us. However, when Paul says something in the context, it's to the Gentiles. Romans through Philemon is to the Gentile churches. And that's different than to ye men of Israel. You don't see Paul saying that. You see it outside of Paul's epistles. 
that's a dispensational change. And we're here, Romans through Philemon. Outside of that, at from chapter 12 of Genesis all the way through Acts when Paul is raised up, and then again when, when we're raptured out of here and this dispensation of grace is done, again, what's the first book? The name is a flag. It says Hebrews. It's to the Hebrews. Hebrews through Revelation. God is going to complete his program with Israel. So if we became spiritual Israel, it would be like what God's going to do with them has been uh, thrown out. And now we're going to get all their promises. It's two separate programs. And so um, they don't see that. That's not what the way they view their viewpoint, their perspective, the way they look at things they see or spiritual Israel. So that's the first way they reframe it. The second way is that they believe there's only one gospel. Let's look at that one. John 3, 16. John 3, 16 used a lot. Let's just read it. Um, let's start in 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son for that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now think about the timeline and where John is talking here. It is before the cross. Christ did not even die and pay for sins yet. He had not done this. They, it was a mystery. They don't even know about it here. It it often is infused into these verses, but that's not what it says. It doesn't say that whosoever believeth that Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again, that the blood of Christ paid for all your sins, and then you're you're saved. It doesn't say that because it does. They don't know. John didn't know that at this point. What happened? It was a mystery. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, If it, had, they, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan and his workers would not have crucified him if he had known the powerful impact the cross would have been. And here in particular is not our gospel. It is the gospel at that time, but not today. Many, many gospels in um, hit God's word. There's not just one. Let's just look at 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> and I encourage you to read the context. And note, especially in uh, John, who it's written to. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at the first beginning, Matthew. It's all to and about the Jews. Here. Corinthians, it's a Gentile church, Paul's writing to them, and it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for my, for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The cross work is right there. Then you can go to Galatians, Galatians 2. Um, we're going to run late. I have a feeling today, but I'll do the best I can to make it between 15 and 20 minutes. Um, let's just see, take, take verse seven, but contrawise, this is, this is, um, the, the Jerusalem meeting and Peter is there and it says, but contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that's Paul as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when, when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen or Gentiles and they into the uh, to the circumcision, two different gospels, not the same gospel. It was not the same gospel of the uncircumcision, 
gospel of the circumcision. It's just another example, many, many examples. That's all we have time for today. So <clears throat> when they think they're spiritual Israel, when someone believes that, if you believe it, it's really believing um, believing that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are written to you today, that the whole Bible and even Hebrews through Revelation is to you. You're going to, through the tr great tribulation period. You can't really understand and believe in the rapture if you believe your spiritual Israel because they were going through. And so um, that's one thing. The second one, or that's the second thing. So the first thing is thinking your spiritual Israel. Second thing is that, that you believe that there's really only one gospel and that it pertains to you, and there's no differences. And the third way we reframe, or people have reframed the, the truth, is that, um, for example, certain things in Israel's program are directly written to us without any discernment. And so, for example, signs, wonders, and miracles. Um, these miraculous happenings that happened in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John um, were, were really something that we're to follow. The commission given to the 12 is our commission. And that was a commission written to Israel. So let's just, the end of that. Uh, basically, Jesus said, go not to the Gentiles, but to the house of Israel when he commissioned his disciples in the beginning. You study that out for yourself. We're not going to have time to go there. But go to Mark 16. At the very end, when Jesus is about to be uh, ascended, um, what, what he does is he tells his apostles some things. And it says... Um, it reinforces what he had been saying all along, 1615. And he said unto them, go ye unto all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Remember, at this point, <clears throat> they really, it was still a mystery. Even though he died, they didn't really understand the significance of his death. It says, so go preach the gospel. What gospel? That Jesus was the Messiah, really, basically. He's the one. He came. They didn't understand the cross work, still didn't. Only that was revealed to Paul, as we'll see later. It says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's the gospel here. But he that believeth not is damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. Think about it. Do all these signs follow you if you are a believer and trust the blood of Christ? Um, in my name shall they cast out devils? They shall speak with new, t new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It says these signs shall follow them that believe. Not just some that believe, all them that believe. It's them that believe. This was the great commission. This was as they go through the tribulation period. As they go through that time here, this is going to be exceedingly needful for them to have certain powers. Jesus' whole earthly ministry was focused on getting them prepared for that um, day of wrath, to go through it. It was supposed to happen, and God halted it to start the, the body of Christ. He stopped it abruptly right here. In Acts, when he raised up Paul, after they stoned Stephen, the third and final time that they rejected the Holy Spirit, he stopped. He stands up. He was supposed to pour out his wrath, and he did not. That's, that's chapter 7 of Acts. And instead, in chapter 9, he raises up Paul to do something else for a period of time. Once we're out of here, it's going to resume, and the wrath will happen. And so... These, these signs and wonders, these do not happen. And yet what people do is reframe the truth. They think that they can cast out devils if they pray. And uh, 
I, I've never heard anyone talk about that one and doing actually doing that today. But you know that many churches speak with new tongues. They also, I've heard some talk about taking up serpents and reframing it to be, oh, well, I was bit by a spider and I didn't die. That's not the same. Viperous serpents biting uh, poisonous serpents, like Paul did, what happened with Paul, uh, as as miracles were showing that he was an apostle of God, proving that he was an apostle, uh, just as Peter was, he did. It bit him at the end of Acts, there in chapter twenty eight, and he just shook it off, and he was not killed. Um, but it's not a spider, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. It is not like drinking the water in your own local town, which I've heard that. It is not. That's reframing the truth. Deadly poison. Take up, a, um, you know, um, some lie or, um, you know, some something that caustic kind of thing and, and drink that. Who's going to do it? We wouldn't because it doesn't work. You'll die for sure. Um, and they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Why isn't it that all the Christians are, aren't going to the, to the, uh, the hospitals and healing everyone? There wouldn't even need to be a hospitals and sharing the gospel as they heal the, the, the sick, all the sick completely, immediately, not well, the doctors are going to heal them and they're going to go through chemotherapy. That's not the way God's talking here. It's an immediate healing, complete healing. You know, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame leap. They reframe it, and therefore there's a lot of confusion. So what I want us to do is it gets people hopeful, hopeful that it might happen. If, they, if they're a good enough Christian, it'll happen, these miracles, signs, and wonders. It didn't say that. If you believe, it said these would be manifest. Ephesians 2, and then we'll stop. Just want to read it. I, I, I just encourage you, think about these things. What does Paul teach us? It's actually chap Ephesians chapter 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, not the Ju nation of Israel, ye men of Israel, you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given un, given me to you were Gentiles, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a fore and few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What the, the risen Christ taught Paul through revelations, we will know that. This is after the cross which in other ages was not made known unto the son of men, sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy pro apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who and less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. It is not the same gospel as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's about the risen Christ and what he accomplished at the cross and how the body of Christ has God in him. We're a new creature. <clears throat> and to make known and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the body of Christ, the manifold wisdom of God. Think on these things. I pray that you understand these things and step away from reframing the truth and allow God, as you look at context, Look at what the passage is saying. The context, immediate context will tell you what it's talking about and to whom it's written. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I pray 
that those that are listening will hear in your precious son's name. Amen.